That's that chimney still stuck in my craw, right? But the point is, these things can happen personally, or they can happen on a broad, uh, broad spectrum. For example, there could be an earthquake. Uh, there could be a war, like what's going on in Ukraine right now. There's, there could be on a wide spectrum that money is very unpredictable. <clears throat> the cure, again, in, in chapter five, is a life of balance, which includes finding joy in the moment, partaking of God's blessing and recognizing them as God's blessing to have a sense of eternity. The fact is that our lives are brief and transitory, and before you know it, you're, you're thinking about eternity because it's coming quick. To rejoice when God empowers us to enjoy his gifts, and by so doing, life does fly by as we have more good days, hopefully, than bad days. Chapter six is which we're looking at today, so I started off at the beginning of the week, I go, man, how can I find enough stuff to fill 12 verses, and Wednesday I'm going, man, what do I have to cut out to, uh, you know? But I will say, chapter six is really a difficult chapter. I really, really struggle with it, you know, learning it and trying to figure out what, and it's just, but hopefully I got it dialed in enough to make a good class out of it. So let's take a look at that. We're gonna read through chapter six now for those people in the youth. Typically what I do is I have people read, each, you know, go from person to person, one verse at a time. Um, now, I understand that youth sometimes has a challenge to participate in the class, which is like this. So I'm just going to have the youth read through these uh, 12 verses, okay? We're going to start way in the back over there, the back corner. And uh, we're gonna, looking at Ecclesiastes chapter 6. We're going to read through verses 1 through 12 and just read across until we hit verse 12. And yes, you're welcome. So Levi, it's chapter 6 of Ecclesiastes, verse 1. I gave you a short verse, so you're welcome for that too. It's in the Old Testament. <laughs> Good and loud so we can hear you. Ecclesiastes 6, verse 1. Let's go back over to the second to the last row there, if you don't mind. Verse 7. Nine. Okay, let's go. How about if we go to Kira? We're at verse ten. Verse 12, Sam, even though you're not in the youth group, you'll, you'll be our, uh, you know, our last book in there. Thanks, everybody. I sure appreciate that. Okay, so you'll notice um, 
our first title, sub, or point one, is provision without blessing. So I'm going to reread the verses. Um, we'll read one through three here. So there is an evil which I have seen under the sun, and it is prevalent among men. A man to whom God has given riches and wealth and honor, so that his soul lacks nothing of all he desires, yet God has not empowered him to eat from them, for a foreigner enjoys them. This is vanity and a severe affliction. If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years, however many they may be, but his soul is not satisfied with good things and he does not have a proper burial, then I say better a miscarriage than he. So we see an evil. Now, in, in the New American Standard, which is what I typically use, we see the word prevalent. That word prevalent is not a terribly good word for that. Uh, the word should be heavy. In fact, most of the other translations insert heavy there. The English Standard Version, the uh, NIV, they use the word heavy, and that is a better word. So, so this is an evil that's very heavy upon mankind. Um, verse 2, it says, God has given this person riches and wealth and honor, so he has more than enough. Uh, notice the description. He has riches, he has wealth, he has honor. That sounds like, humanly speaking, the ideal life, does it not? I mean, some people have riches, some people have honor, some people have all the above. So this person that he's describing has the, what we would consider, humanly speaking, the ideal life. Um, so he has all that he desires. Who does that sound like, by the way? <laughs> I saw your mouth the words. Solomon. It does sound like Solomon, doesn't it? Now, it isn't, but it sounds just like him because of what he's already said, like in chapter 2. I've got all this stuff. Anything I want, I can have. I, I got it all. And yet, he doesn't seem to have the ability to enjoy it. So it's not Solomon, but it sure sounds like him. In verse 2, it says, um, God has not empowered him to eat from them. So uh, he lacks what I call the blessing of 519. So take a look, go up to 519, because this is from last week. Furthermore, as for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth, he has also empowered him to eat from them and to receive his reward and rejoice in his labor. This is the gift from God. We talked last week that this is a different gift than having the riches and wealth. So in one case, you have the riches and wealth. The second blessing, I'm calling the second blessing, is the ability to enjoy them. Okay? Uh, give you an example. Being from the fire service, how many times did we sit down to have dinner and the bell goes off? I have a great meal. I don't have the power to enjoy it because i got to go help somebody, right? So in a sense, that could just be a really brief illustration of what it means to have everything you need, but yet for some reason you can't enjoy it. So this person in chapter 6 lacks the blessing of 519. Uh, for some reason, God has not empowered him to enjoy his possessions. In fact, he carries it further in verse 2, for a foreigner enjoys them. So we see a foreigner is going to eat the prosperity that this man has accumulated. It doesn't belong to him. He doesn't get to eat and enjoy it, but a foreigner gets to eat it in, instead. And that would be a tragedy. That would absolutely be a tragedy. So how could this happen? How could it happen that a person would have riches, wealth, honor, and yet somebody else winds up eating them? What are some circumstances that would exist that would cause that to occur? Okay, he died. Died early. Okay? What's that? Pride? Did it say pride? Okay, pride. Kiara, can you expand on that a little bit maybe? Huh? Okay, and his pride doesn't get any of it. Okay, hold on to that. Craig. Uh, Craig. Oh. Maybe a little, uh, maybe a little, and I can't, I'll spell this wrong, so just to let you know. Embezzlement. Hooked on phonics. It works for me. Dave. Oh, there you go. I didn't think about that. Mental issues. You'd think mental issues would be the first thing on my mind, right? <laughs> 
Don't know why I say that. Kristen, no time? Oh, there you go. Okay, no time. Other ways. Yes, Levi. Theft. Theft. Ooh, there you go. Kind of goes back with em embezzlement. We'll just make that a separate issue because it could be somebody breaking in, stealing all you got. So it could be different. Good. Anyone else? How about the ute? Ute, oh dear. Anything? How can somebody, you get riches and wealth? Because some of you probably will have riches and wealth someday, seriously, and, and, and honor, and then suddenly you can't enjoy them. Why, why would, any other ideas what might be from the youth? Sickness, there you go, excellent, sickness. Um, just to kind of give you a story, some years ago, <clears throat> I'm riding with a couple of guys in, in the fire engine, and this one guy behind the steering wheel says to me, you know, you know, money is the answer to everything. I go, what? Money is the answer to everything. I've told this story before, so if I have, sorry, you have to endure it again, right? So I'm thinking, I said to myself, Lord, this, what do I say? He's not a Christian, of course. I said, well, what do you mean money is the answer to everything? He says, man, you know, if I had $4 million, life would be fantastic. I said, really? And the other firefighters go, no, 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 money's not the answer to everything. Okay, well. So I said, well, what if you had $4 million, but you didn't, didn't have the ability to enjoy it? He said, well, that couldn't happen. And so I, and I didn't, didn't have this in the idea in my head. It came to me, so it was the Holy Spirit. He says, let's say, for example, you're driving along, you're in a car wreck, and you're paralyzed from the neck down, and the court awards you $4 million. That's not a part of my plan. That's what he said. <laughs> really, it's not a part of your plan? Okay. So the conversation just didn't go much further than that. But, you know, kind of like what Gabe said, illness, yeah, things can happen. Peggy. That kind of takes in a couple of things, right? Unsatisfied, time, okay, good. Anyone else? Dave. War, oh yeah. Yes, indeed, and we're looking at some of that right now, aren't we? Teresa. Sure. We'll call it tribute. That's what they called it in ancient times, tribute. Eric. Okay. Okay, Daniel. Nice. Good job, everybody. These are great. I, I thought of two or three, so everybody else truly added. I appreciate that. So, so some, some ways that a person can have a lot and yet not enjoy it, they die early death, which is what I think is talked about here, which we'll talk about, we'll, we'll mention why I think that uh, in a short while. Pride, embezzlement, yeah, you go to your bank account, and by the way, I just received a, an email from the Department of Licensing saying that their website was hacked the other day, including my information. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> mental issues, see, this stuff's relevant, 3,000 years ago, and we're still, it's relevant. Time, not having the time, theft, to being unsatisfied and just simply can't enjoy it, even though you got it. Uh, being in debt, have it tied up, tribute, war and self. So these are some of the many ways that you could have wealth, honor, etc., and not have the ability to enjoy them. So that helps expand our mind a little bit. So now the next question is, why didn't God give him the second gift? The second gift, remember, is 5 verse 19, where God empowered him to eat of his own stuff, and now he's not. So, so why didn't God give him the second gift? Why would you think? Levi. Okay, I didn't understand all that you said, kind of quiet, but what I'm taking is, Maybe there's something between him and God which prevents him from enjoying it. Is that what you're saying in a nutshell? Okay, good, good. Thank you.
By the way, Heather, welcome back. <laughs> I just noticed you're there. You've been gone for a while. Thank you. Okay, other thoughts. Why didn't God allow him to enjoy it? Here's another idea. Kind of take it a little bit in a different direction. Um, sounds a little wonky because you say it's a gift. The first thing I think of is salvation is also a gift. Is there some way I can disqualify myself by, to not receive God's gift of salvation? I see people going this. I see people doing this. I would do this. Is there? It's a free gift offered to every one of us here. Is there a way that we can negate that? Yes, sir. Unrepentant sin? Okay, good, good. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. So what he's saying is, by rejecting it altogether, you, you're disqualified to receive it, right? So there is, there is kind of a part of myself in that salvation thing. Dave, unforgivable sin. <laughs> I know where you're going. Okay, good. Yes. Dean. Yeah, we're not going to go that direction, but there's more to it than that, actually. There really is. Yes. I say more to it and less to it, but anyway, we're not going to go there. Teresa? Right. So, thank you. So, so oh, go ahead, Jen. It's not what? Yes. Okay. Yes. Good, good, good. So my next question that leads into this, and this is probably more, more rhetorical now, is can one disqualify oneself of his God's gift or empowerment to receive enjoyment and blessing for what he's given? And the answer is obviously yes, you can. God offers that gift, just like God offers the gift of salvation. But if I turn my back on it, well, I've rejected it. And even though it's a gift, and it is, if I say no, I can't benefit from it. In the same way, I'm looking at empowerment to enjoy things. If, if I refuse to accept it, as Jen mentioned there a second ago, that it's from God, and, and you know I did it myself, then I basically negate my ability to receive the blessing of enjoyment for what God has given me. My first thought in the Bible is the people of Israel, when they for, were led out into the wilderness, they had everything they needed. They had, uh, they had manna, they had water, mostly, right? They even had, we think, shade from the cloud, from the, uh, from, from the heat. They, their clothes didn't wear out. You know, they had God's Ten Commandments. They had, all, they had all sorts of stuff, but yet they spent most of their time doing what? Rumbling, fighting, complaining, right? They spent most of their time being negative. In fact, at first, God didn't, didn't rebuke them too much at first, and then they kept doing it and doing it. And finally, the coup de grace was, you, you're going to spend 40 years in the wilderness until you all die. Wow. You know, so God had a limit there, and they passed over that limit. So they brought discipline, not additional blessing. So we see that this and not being able to enjoy what God has given to us is indeed, verse 2, a vanity and severe affliction. Vanity, we, we understand in, in the book of Ecclesiastes, means like emptiness. Uh, you could translate it soap bubbles. You know, they are significant and last as long as soap bubbles, and then they're gone, right? So it's vanity and a severe affliction. It's a severe affliction to have all you need, and for some reason, you can't enjoy it. It's taken away. The probable cause. Um, in verse 3, we see he is truly blessed but not satisfied. Hence our title. Um, 
the unsatisfied life. That's what this person is living. He's unsatisfied. He has everything he needs, but he's not satisfied. Now, hyperbole is used to express that. Hyperbole is saying something in, an ast in a ridiculous way to make a point. I've told you a million times, for the youth, right? I've told you a million times to clean your room. You're thinking, well, you couldn't have told me more than two or three hundred times, right? But you're using the hyperbole to make the point. If a man has lots of children, a hundred children in this case, which is even more than I had, um, a long life and good things. Even if he had all those things, but his soul is not satisfied, then it's for nothing. It's emptiness. Now this doesn't seem to be Solomon, and the reason I say that is because we don't know how many kids Solomon had. Now we know he had you know, 700 wives and 300 concubines, so we can assume he had a few kids, right? But interestingly, I, I looked, and it doesn't say how many that he had. And also, it doesn't say how long he lived. I thought the Bible said how long Solomon lived, but it doesn't. So a lot of, looking at what some of the scholars think, is they think that around 60 or so years, which is way before his prime, right? You know, you don't reach your prime until you're what, 63, 64, something like that? Ha, ha, ha. Anyway, that's a dad joke, sorry. The dads understand that. Um, <laughs> so anyway, he has all this stuff, but he can't enjoy it. And then, interestingly, in verse 3, we add something to it that you can kind of miss if you just read over quickly. It says, um, and he does not even have a proper burial. So we have a person, he has all that he needs, he has wealth, he has honor, somebody else enjoys it for some reason, and he doesn't even receive a proper burial. Why would that be? First of all, what is a proper burial? And don't think so much now, but may maybe think about at this time. What would a proper burial look like? Peggy. Yeah. You know, back at this time, it is, it is really a big event. You would actually, as silly as it sounds to us, you would hire mourners, professional mourners, to come in and mourn for you. I want that job, right? Work on my crying, my wailing, you know. Anyway. Um, so it's a big deal, especially if you're an honorable person. People would come out of the woodwork to honor this individual, and that would be considered a proper burial. So go ahead, Teresa. Ah, oh, yes. Okay, that's a great point, too. So back at this time, you would usually have a family burial cave or something that they would bury you in. And you know, there again, it sounds kind of gross, but once your body decays and winds up just being bones, they'd take your bones and put them in, an, I think it's called an ossuary, um, with your other ancestors that are there. So that would be considered a proper burial. An improper burial would be like you're just buried out in the field somewhere, or maybe a mass grave. Go ahead, Dean. Ossuary, thank you. Appreciate that. Dean's my resident scholar, and I count on him a lot, so thank you, Dean. Yes, Jen. Right. Yes, exactly. Good. He had a state funeral, in essence. Levi. Yeah. Well, Levi saying, in essence, is maybe the man's not honorable, so he didn't receive an honorable uh, burial. It could have been that he spent all his money, lived for himself. Think Ebenezer Scrooge again, right? I referred to him a couple of times. Ebenezer Scrooge, before he was visited by the ghosts of Christmas past, etc., the kind of burial he would have been, he would have received all sorts of money, etc., and he would have received it, you know, kind of a pauper's burial because no one basically cared. Um, 
So in chapter 4, verse 8, we took a look at a workaholic, a person who is working his life away, and yet he doesn't stop to ask himself, why am I working so hard? And, and we didn't, it does, it's not definitive, but we talked about that could refer to the person who is a workaholic and who winds up isolating his family, and, and because he's so self-centered about money and all of his family just fritters away. Um, my father and my wife's father received kind of a, an unhonorable burial. Now, they received a burial, but both of them were non-Christians, and they uh, lived a very non-Christian life, and they both wound up dying alone, and they wound up getting a burial that would have been much different had they lived a life for Jesus and, you know, worked, worked. I'm not saying like because they didn't earn it, but you know what I mean? If they lived an honorable life, then their family would truly grieve their passing and go out of their way to demonstrate that. But as it was because of the life they led, they got nothing like that. So it wasn't exactly a proper burial. Now, of course, there could be other circumstances. We're talking about an economic turn down. We're talking about a war. So there are situations that could occur. You don't receive a proper burial, not because you don't deserve it, but because sometimes circumstances intervene. I'll pick up verse 3 again. I'll read through 6. If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years, however many they be, but his soul is not satisfied with good things, and he does not have a proper burial, then I say better the miscarriage than he. For it comes in futility and goes into obscurity, and its name is covered in obscurity. It never sees the sun, and it never knows anything. It is better off than he. Even if the other man lives a thousand years twice and does not enjoy good things, do not all go to the same place. So he's comparing this individual who couldn't enjoy his wealth, etc., to a miscarriage. He's saying a miscarriage is better off than he. Why? What's his reasoning behind that? Okay. Right, okay, good. Other thoughts? Peggy. Okay, because he lived for only for himself, potentially. Maybe it would have been better if he didn't live at all. Good. Jen. He doesn't have to endure some of the difficulties that not only fall on the people that might be, you know, judged by God, but just all of us. We all have situations that we go through where things are bad from a human perspective, right? And the, per the individual that's miscarried, I believe, is fully human, and that person gets to see Jesus the first face he sees or she sees, which is a mind-boggling thing to think about, right? We would be hurting. We are hurting because we've gone through it. But they see Jesus, and life couldn't be better for them. Go ahead, Lou. Okay, excellent point. So because, because uh, this person might not have done good things, it's better for the miscarriage who, who is in darkness, but it's physical darkness, versus what it could make if it's born. Is that kind of the point you're making? Okay, okay. Excellent point. Now, this is also part of the reason why I think the individual referred to here has died. You know, because it's compared to a miscarriage, it talks about other things here. So I think that that's the tragedy that's occurred. He's living his life, he has riches, honor, wealth, uh, perhaps a long life, and all of a sudden he dies, and he dies in dishonor, and somebody else winds up getting his stuff, as it were. In verse 6, it says, do not all go to the same place. Now, uh, I don't think 
when you see stuff like this, you say that Solomon is, is saying that people, when they die, they all go to the same place no matter what they do. Well, he's not exactly saying that. Remember, he's, he's teaching from the perspective of under the sun, from the human perspective. From the human perspective, when you die, you're just like a dog because you both go, you're buried in the grave, right? We know there's more to that, and we'll see Solomon knows that too in chapters to come. But it could be a little disconcerting when you read that and go, is he saying that? Not exactly. Also, the word here is Sheol, and Sheol is often a euphemism just to refer to the grave. So, again, humanly speaking, when anyone dies, they go into the grave. And whether they're good or bad, miscarriage or not, miscarriage would have it better because the miscarriage doesn't have to go through all this stuff, and he or she gets to see Jesus the very first thing. Verses 7 to 8, I see it. If you look at your notes, a possible reason why this individual endured this. Even if, sorry, all a man's labor is for his mouth, and yet the appetite is not satisfied. For what advantage does the wise man have over the fool? What advantage does the poor man have knowing how to walk before the living? What the eyes see is better than what the soul desires. This too is futility and striving after the wind. Verse 7, yet his appetite is never satisfied. Hence the title of the lesson, the unsatisfied life. He's never satisfied. He's got all he needs. He's got riches. He's got wealth. He's got honor. He's got everything, but he doesn't sit back and enjoy it. He's perhaps self-consumed or whatever. Now, there's an ongoing appetite. All man's labor is for his mouth. Now, we know that's true, right? Part of the reason that we work is because we occasionally get hungry, and you got to have this stuff called money, usually, to buy stuff. And so our appetite kind of works for us in that way. There's more to it than that, though, because uh, it talks about, you know, in verse 9, about what the eyes see. So this appetite, you know, could be thought of as a physical appetite, but really it's talking about the appetite in general and not just hunger. Now, must we participate in this? Must we participate in this arrangement where we have to satisfy our appetites with work, etc.? Yes or no? Yeah. You got to participate, right? Unless you're living off the state or whatever, right? So you must participate. So we have to be a part of the system. We have to work. We have to get money. We have to buy things. We have to think ahead for our families. We have to do this and that. So we participate. Yet when we participate, we're not to become saturated. To participate and then to become saturated are two different things where you become consumed with this. Now many, if not most people, have an ongoing appetite that's rarely satisfied for any length of time. We talked about this a few weeks ago, and Jen brought the point up. You get something new, a shiny thing? Sweet! Two weeks later, it's, oh, and you're looking for the next shiny thing, right? And so many people, including some of us, I've been guilty, been, I say have been like I've conquered it, but anyway, I've been guilty of that, right? The next shiny thing, right? Um, so verse 9 talks about the soul desires. Um, um, it's interesting, whether he's wise or a fool, it doesn't matter. Whether you're a wise person or a foolish person, you've got these appetites, these things that motivate you, and it doesn't matter whether you're wise or a foolish person. It's not an intelligence thing. It's a human situation. It's the way we are. We have these appetites. Again, part of the reason is because we have that God-shaped hole, that we keep trying to fill with things, and it never works because only God can fill that hole that he himself designed into us. So we're looking at materialism here. In verse 9, it says, To be satisfied is better. What the eyes see is better than what the soul desires. I've mentioned in an earlier class about um, the United States having probably the best advertising people in the entire world. Um, what do advertising people do when they make their ads? What are they trying to do? Lem. 
trying to get you to buy their stuff. Yeah, good. Someone else? Make you dissatisfied? This, yeah, satisfying the dissatisfaction. Yes, yes, good. Any others? Yes. Frustrate you? Persuade, thank you. Or frustrate can be. Oh, why can't I have that, you know? Good. Others? They make you dissatisfied with what you've got. You might have a perfectly good widget. This widget is great. It does everything I want to do, but it so happens that it's not quite as shiny as this widget. This widget would satisfy my desires more, but it doesn't do anything more. No, but it's, it's more beautiful or whatever it is, whatever the situation is, right? So advertisers in America are fantastic. And by the way, oh, I forget the number. I should, I, I'm kind of winging it here, as you can tell. Um, we see hundreds, if not thousands, of advertisements a week. Your iPhone, you know, you watch TV, you know, newspapers. We see these pop-up things. They saturate us with this stuff, and they're great at making us think we're not satisfied. And yet, as Solomon says here, and this is pre-advertising, what your eyes see is better than what you desire. Hold your place there and turn over to uh, Philippians chapter 4. We'll take a look at Paul and how he, his perspective. Philippians chapter 4. So Philippians chapter 4 and verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you've revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I'm in. I'm in. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. So Paul was having to work while he was ministering, and then he received a large gift from the Philippian believers, which allowed him to stop doing the tent making and going full time into ministry. Uh, so here's Paul. Paul says, I've done them both. I've been very poor. And I've been very wealthy by comparison, and yet I have satisfaction. So he doesn't become captivated by the money, or he doesn't complain because he's quote-unquote poor, but he has balance in that way, as we are too. And last of all, verses 10 to 12, we see, Whatever exists has already been named, and it is known what man is, for he cannot dispute with him who is stronger than he is. For there are many words which increase futility. What then is the advantage to a man? For who knows what, good, what is good for a man during his lifetime, during the few years of his futile life? He will spend them like a shadow, for who can tell a man what will be after him under the sun? So we see God is sovereign. In verse 10, we see that God has set the stage of our lives. So wherever you are, whatever you're doing, God has set that stage and put you there. That's, that's where you are. That's where you are to shine or where you are to grow, as it were. Um, if sections 2 and 3 refer to the man in section 1, which I believe it does, who, couldn't, who tragically could not enjoy his blessings, we have to remember who is the sovereign one. It is God. Also in verse 10, we see that God knows us and he knows what we need. He calls the shots. He's truly stronger than us. So I, the idea I get in my mind is this individual is having a tough time. He's arguing with God about why things are the way they are. He's complaining. He is carrying on. Many, many words he's using. So, but there again, he knows us and he knows what we need. He calls the shots. Plus, when God deals with us as believers, what is... What is the way he deals with us? How does he deal with us as believers, assuming we're living as he would like us to? Say it again. He does discipline us, yes. 
And even discipline is because of what? It's because of love, right? The whole reason that parents discipline their children is because they love them. They want the very best for them. And, and even if it isn't, I see some people grinning. It's really true. <laughs> even if, you know, e- even if you can't see it, it really is to benefit and to make you more like Christ. Um, he deals with us in love. So why does he do these things? Because God, see, I made mistakes when I was a parent. And sometimes I discipline. In fact, one of my daughters, Angela, said to me in our last visit two weeks ago, Dad, I remember a time when you disciplined me and it was wrong. And, and you came and apologized later. I thought, Phew. <laughs> I don't remember it, but I'm glad that I did apologize, right? You know, God never has to apologize. So if God disciplines us or if he puts us in situations that are hard, it's because he does love us, not because he doesn't love us and wants to create a hard life for us. And we may complain, but see point three, God is sovereign again. But now, let's step over here a little bit and ask the question, is it okay to complain to God? Is it okay to complain to God? Yes or no? Somebody says yes? Daniel? Depends on your attitude and the way you're doing it. Okay, good. God already knows what you want. Okay, good. Peggy? Yeah, isn't that true? How many times have I wished it was a little bit different? But God, I need that. (laughs) No, no, you don't. Jen? Oh, there's a good... Okay, that's that's a good point. Dave, Dave. Yeah, which is my next point, right? So read the Psalms. Did David or the psalmist ever complain? The audience says, yeah, you bet he did, you know. Now, I will say this. uh, When you read his complaints, it kind of goes with what's just been said as far as attitude. Because you see David complaining about the situation or maybe complaining about people but you still see an attitude. It's not, you hate me. That's why you're good for nothing. You hate me. You've made my life miserable. You know, and and it's not complaining like that because that would be wrong, right? So so it's not wrong to complain, keeping in mind who he is and, and, and um, and, and what he can do. I think God would rather we complain to him than hold it in, as it were, because as Daniel said, he knows it anyway. He reads your every thought, so it's not like you're hiding something from him. I would tell the Lord I'm having a bad day, but I don't want to make him disappointed with me. You know, I hear you, he says, right? Um, and sometimes it's not com- just complaining. Sometimes it's writhing in pain. Sometimes it's, it's not just complaining, but you're writhing on the floor in pain because things are so bad. And if you haven't been there yet, you will. Absolutely, you will. Because life has its ups and downs for a Christian or non-Christian alike. And God wants us to call out to him when we're having a bad situation, when we're writhing in pain. And God, it says that God is, is near the brokenhearted. He saves those that are distressed. And he does. And he, he treats, imagine you as a child being broken and your dad or mom walks in your room and you're crying. What, what are they going to do? You know? They're going to come to you, and they're going to comfort you. God does that to us in a slightly different way because we can't see him physically, but he certainly does. My feelings about this man in chapter 6 is that he was complaining, but he wasn't complaining necessarily in the right way. Things aren't going the way I want, and he didn't have exactly the right attitude about it. Otherwise, I think there would have been a different outcome. He was perhaps whining. Don't you love it when kids whine? I had 10 kids. I know what whining is, right? And as a parent, how likely are you to do wonderful things for that whiny child? Oh, Tommy, would you like a piece of cake? Oh, no. No, you're looking for the good child, for Ricky, who 
who does his homework. Ricky gets a piece of cake, right? Anyway, don't complain. Don't whine. Don't whine, that is. Who knows what is good? In verse 12, it says, for who knows what is good for a man during his lifetime? The interesting thing is Solomon doesn't, humanly speaking. The whole book of Ecclesiastes is to say, I don't really know. I don't really know under the sun what life is all about. Now, toward the end of Ecclesiastes, he will say it very clearly what life's about. So, so it becomes very clear at the end. But in the middle, there's back and forth as he is sifting and struggling as a non-believer would about what life's all about. He doesn't know. Who knows? Well, only God knows. And the whole book is written to tell us he doesn't know, but that God knows. Go back to chapter 5, verse 18, and I'm going to tack that on the end of chapter 6, although it doesn't belong there, but it still fits. Here's what I've seen to be good and fitting to eat. Good and fitting. To eat, to drink, and to enjoy oneself in all one's labor in which he toils under the sun during the few years of his life which God has given him, for this is his reward. Furthermore, as for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth, he has also empowered him to eat from them and to receive his reward and to rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. For he will not consider the years of his life because God keeps him occupied with gladness of heart. God wants us to enjoy what he's given to us. He wants us to appreciate it and, again, to remember where it came from. It came from God. I mean, yes, you had a part because you worked and you earned it, but who gave you health and strength to work and earn it? Who gave you the job? Who gave you all these things? And it all comes from God. And we enjoy it when we recognize this and give praise, when we are satisfied, when we count our blessings as it says. Any final thoughts? Jen. Yes, they do. Good. Other thoughts? All right. Well, thanks, everybody. I appreciate your, your attendance and for paying attention and everything. Let's go ahead and we'll close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again that we can come together and we can take a look at, in this case, a fairly difficult chapter in Ecclesiastes. We can sift it. We can grind it, as it were. And we can see, hopefully, what you meant and also, Lord, what we can do. And basically, Lord, help us to be satisfied. Help us to, to not engage in, in just seeking for the next shiny thing just for the sake of that. But help us, Lord, to be satisfied and to remember everything we have comes from you. There's nothing that we have that we can say, this didn't come from God. Uh, so, Lord, I pray, help us to be a thankful people. Lord, I pray, please be with us in the next service. Please be with the worship team. I pray, Lord, that they might play skillfully, sing skillfully. I pray for that joyful noise for you and that your Holy Spirit might open our hearts to worship and be with Pastor Justin as he preaches your word. And I pray that you would help him to preach in power, wisdom, and zeal that we might grow in you. We thank you for our time. In Jesus' name, amen.